Chris Plant, I don't know what we're going to do, but it's just you and I today. Wait, it's just us? Just us. That would explain why Griffin and Justin aren't here. (laughs) (laughs) Very astute. Uh, Yeah, no, this is just us. The last last time we did an an episode that was just us was the Just the Two of Us episode, uh, which was a couple months ago. And I feel like at this point we probably... I don't know. I think we need a name for these episodes. What 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 would be like top of mind for you? Would it be called like um, the Besties Two Point Is that like on no. original? Well, first of all, I think that's a drag on the other guys. I don't think we would want oh, to imply that yeah. this is an upgrade <laughs> from when they're here. Um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Besties bonus. Um, besties. B sides. That, that feels like too much of a downgrade. You so, know, like yeah. Now we're good... we're knocking ourselves at that point. Mm-hmm. 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 How about how about besties resties? <laughs> the besties resties. The besties resties. We like are the it's... resties of the besties, and I don't know. I guess we're gonna talk about not it like the... yeah, not like we're what? taking a nap. I want to make it clear. It's not like we're like resting. Uh, yeah, I wasn't laurels. confused. I wasn't confused. There. I didn't think. We oh, were it's, I, a nap. it seemed like you were confused. It no, seemed no. Like no. <laughs> so you get it. You get that. Like it's the rest of the things. Yeah, and, and we're the rest of the besties. Like the remainder oh, of the besties. That also is true. <laughs> okay, it's a lock. We're doing it. Okay. Hello and welcome to the Besties Podcast. It's a video game club that goes all year long, has nothing to do with books. My name is Ross Frustick. I'm joined today by Christopher Thomas Plant. Hey, Hello. Chris. I am so hot. <laughs> I am so hot right now. Why is that? I'm, I'm recording in, uh, so I moved to sunny California. It's very warm in sunny California. It's very, you know what? It's actually not too bad in Orange County right now. The OC. But... The OC, thank you. Um, I believe it's actually the OC bitch. Um, <laughs> I don't say that word except for when I'm quoting TV. Um, but I am in my office, which for some reason has terrible sound. So I have to wear a blanket over my head and the microphone while we record. And I am sweating everywhere. <laughs> I did not know that I could sweat so much and from so many places at the same time, I I will be dehydrated in mere seconds. You know, you might say you say that you didn't know you were capable of that, but I knew you were capable of that because I've seen you run around during E3 and boy gets sweaty. That's true. I look like I've been uh, running around Death Mor- Mountain in, uh, uh, in Goron City. Am I right? Is that a good segue? That was a great to- segue to you. what we're going to be talking about today, which is a brand new, newly released game. That just came out. I just said three things that mean the same thing. It is The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Chris Plant, let's start off by asking, why are we talking about the Breath of the Wild? We're talking about Breath of the Wild because uh, regular listeners might have noticed that we've talked about a lot of Zelda lately. And I was wrong. It's it's basically the long story short of it. I was not down on Breath of the Wild, but I would say that I wasn't as warm to it is maybe other members of this team have been, you know? Mm. And I think I've been trying to figure out why that is, and I'm sure we'll talk about it in the show, but the long story short is I started playing it again, finally, uh, during this whole move process, because, hey, it's on Switch. Why not? Turns out, and and this is going to shock people, Breath of the Wild, a pretty good game. (laughs) Pretty good! I I I think Nintendo did it this time. And it should be noted that we're not going to just spend, because we've done this before several years mm-hmm. ago. We probably spent a lot of time talking about how great Breath of the Wild is, but that is not our plan today. No. You're going to ask a pretty interesting question today. And the question is, what things haven't other games stolen from Breath of the Wild, but should steal from Breath of the Wild? Yeah, basically like what it, it still feels kind of ahead of its time, even after all these years. That's the because nicer way to put it. I put the edge on it. The, you you, you sort did. of presented it in a nicer way. You made it kind of like, ooh, 
like like you were laying down the gauntlet to the folks at uh, uh, Electronic Arts and Atari. <laughs> uh, that is true. Uh, very accurate. Okay, so uh, before we jump into that, we're going to have a quick break, and then we'll be right back. Okay, so we're going to start. And and again, we've got a big list here. We're going to talk about a bunch of things that we feel like were, as Plant said, way ahead of their time for Breath of the Wild and mm. is kind of shocking that we haven't seen them in more games. That's not to say that these things haven't appeared in some games, but it's I would say broadly speaking, we don't see them often or we don't see them executed as well as they are in Breath of the Wild. And we are here to change that. You want to start out, Plant? Yeah, I'm going to start out with the thing that I have really enjoyed the most. So... And this will get at why I think I, I didn't bounce off the game, but struggled with it. Mm. When the game came out, I remember distinctly, it was right before a, a game developers conference in San Francisco. And I had the game on, on my brand new Switch. I think it was like a, a review build, right? Yeah. And I was able to play this while traveling. And it blew my brain out of my nostrils. Anyway, so I'm on this flight, right? And and I'm and I'm loving this, but I'm also under the pr- the the pressure that I had when I was, you know, doing a lot more reviews of like, hey, I I need to write about this and I need to see as much of this as possible. Hmm. That is not the way to play this game. It turns out. Um and I think I think that was part of it. And then I think the other part of it is I was a bit of an asshole. <laughs> and I needed to see if you could break the game and, like, just how well would the game work if I didn't, didn't like, take its its cues just a little bit. Okay. Not, like, you know, follow the, 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 cr- the breadcrumbs everywhere. But, like, I would be like, okay, this mountain is in the way. Clearly it doesn't want me to go this direction. I'm going to spend an hour scaling this mountain to sure. just see where I can get and then, like, use food to get into places that I should not get into because you get these buffs. And I, and effectively, like, break the game. Um, and that's not fun. It's neat. It's neat that the game lets me do it. But, like, that would have been good for, like, a second or a third or 50th playthrough mm-hmm. and not a first one. So this time I have gone into it and kind of just tried to meet it on its own terms, uh, which you should really do with every game when you're reviewing it, I, <laughs> I now know, in hindsight. Um, and... In doing that, I, what I've been really impressed by is how it kind of lets you have it both ways. I'm not rushing to, you know, there are the four big bosses that you need to go complete, which are the kind of the big dungeons of the game. I'm not really prioritizing that. So I'm not like just completely mainlining it. But I am, you know, going from tower to tower in the game to open up the map. Sure. And what I'm I'm just like so impressed by is... You know, there's the Ubisoft way of doing kind of towers where you climb them and, and uh, reveal part of the map. And they, you know, do this in Far Cry where it's kind of like a little tiny puzzle, uh, platforming puzzle. Yeah. And, and, that's, and that's, I mean, when you said like you wrote on the rundown here, the towers feel like accomplishments. That was the first thought that I had was how uh, the Assassin's Creed games do those towers or Far Cry, as you said. Yeah. And the towers in this game also do that and actually do it poorly. Um, they're not, it is not pleasurable to climb the tower itself. Um, okay. So that's not what I mean. <laughs> but getting to the towers, actually, you know, oh, looking across the landscape, it, spotting it with your uh, your your binoculars, um, and then gradually making your way across hills and valleys and mountains and streams, and in making that effort, it, every time I did it, it felt like it had been designed perfectly for me. Mm-hmm. Like it felt so intentional and so beautiful. And there were like landmarks, you know, um, pieces of, you know, that's destroyed civilizations. And uh, I, I came across strangers on the way who, you know, were willing to sell me things. And I, each one felt like its own mini adventure, despite me very much choosing my own direction there. You know, like I, it's not like I was on some very clear defined path. Yeah. Or I was and I just couldn't tell. And either way, it doesn't matter. It's magic, and I I adore it. And it's a thing that, I weirdly, I've seen um, open-world games move away from the tower thing because they don't want to be like Ubisoft, which I think is kind of throwing the baby out with the bathwater. The tower baby. The tower baby out with the, yeah, with the tower bathwater. Sure. Um, uh, And... I think the, the core idea of it, of it, you know, having these pillars that invite you across the landscape that you then get rewarded for by learning more about the area that you're already in, that is so fundamentally good 
it's just been wrecked by you know <laughs> so many games. We're like, okay, well now we're going to put a hundred of those in it, mm-hmm. and it's going to be a, a time sink, and it's not going to be rewarding. Yeah, I think there are like ten maybe in total, and I do. Uh, I have had the same feeling you had. Like the common occurrence would be like, I'm going to climb a tower. I'll see three towers in the distance. I'll pick one of them and go straight at it. And obviously some of that I'm gliding, some of that I'm riding a horse, some of that I'm fighting through guys. But the fact that you can really go at at any order for them is pretty remarkable. And as you said, it does feel like a level that was designed between those two towers when really there wasn't. I mean, arguably the entire map is like the level that was designed. But it makes you, the way the game is built, it makes you feel like you're having these unique handcrafted adventures when you're almost not. Um, so yeah, no, I, that, that's a good point. I actually never hadn't really thought about the towers since I originally played it. And, um, that does sort of remind me, uh, how damn good they were. Uh, I, I want to let the, uh, the listener know that Frush put together an outline for this episode and it has a list of, of potential things from the game for us to talk about. And the very first thing on the list, I almost wanted to, I wanted to start with this, to be honest, I really did. It's the biggest troll. We can't. St- we could not start with it because we would have lost half our listeners. Yeah, but the people that stayed would have been so dedicated. Okay, That's true. So again, just a reminder, we are talking about uh, mechanics that other games should steal from Breath of the Wild but haven't, or a nicer way to put that. And the mechanic that I'm going to talk about is meaningful weapon durability, specifically breakable weapons in Breath of the Wild, and why uh-huh. haven't more games stolen this? <laughs> yeah, why haven't they? <laughs> um, as people might know, uh, the weapons in Breath of the Wild break after you've used them a bunch of times. Uh, people feel very strongly, one way or the other, about whether this is a good or a bad thing. Many people believe it's a bad thing. It makes you frustrated and scared to use the weapons because, oh no, I'm going to lose my awesome sword forever and I'm never going to get it back. And I get that. I get that argument. But I actually think that having thoughtful interactions with the items that you pick up along the way is important. Um, And I do think by having durability, it forces you to put yourself in situations that you would not ordinarily put yourself in. As an example, you come up upon uh, upon a bunch of ice monster guys, and you've got your fire sword, and you take two swings, and then the fire sword breaks. And suddenly you're kind of scrambling, right? Because you have to figure out, oh, hey, where am I going to, how am I going to take these guys down using non-ideal weaponry? Whereas you think about Skyrim, for example, in Skyrim, you have your kit uh, that just mows down every bastard that comes your way, and it's not a problem. Now, there is durability in Skyrim. It's totally arbitrary. It has no impact. You fix things for like two pennies and never think of it again. Um, Whereas in Breath of the Wild, you genuinely think about, how should I spend this? It's a really important early game because you have like no inventory slots. So what you're filling with your inventory, whether it's like a bunch of sticks or like a log or whatever you're going to get early in the game, really, really matters. Um, it especially matters in areas like, what's the name of that island you land in and you have no items? Oh, ever. It's like out on the east part of the map, um, whatever it's uh, called. Um, yeah. There's like a number of moments where it like really matters how you're filling your inventory. And I feel like you don't get that experience with weapons that don't break, even though I know it like isn't the like power fantasy you might want. It does force you to make interesting decisions in the same way that like you make those same decisions in a game like uh, Spelunky or uh, whatever, a rogue of some sort. Uh, You're constantly like having to make those tough calls. Are there ways to improve this system? Yes, undeniably. Weapon durability is not perfect. I think it could be better in um, in Breath of the Wild 2, but I do think it doesn't get as much credit as it should for really making people get more creative with how they play through uh, Breath of the Wild. And if you hate me now, I'm sorry. Uh, so, okay. I, much like my feelings with this game, I have gone on a jury a jury 
I've gone on a journey. I've gone on a journey with weapon durability. Um, I even wrote on Polygon. Uh, we did a whole team roundup of you know what are our opinions of weapon durability, and I definitely came on the more negative side. Um, and once again, dear listener, I'm wrong. I am so wrong, and I'm not. I but I'm but I'm. I don't know if I would include it on this list of things that people should uh, rip off or borrow. I think it works really well in this very specific type of game, <laughs> which is all about forcing you to survive in in a weird way. I like I am not a huge fan of survival uh, games on PC. I didn't like starting all the way back with Minecraft and then working to like actual survival games. Um, I, I have struggled to get into them. It it never really clicks with me in terms of like collecting resources and yada 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 but i think this game borrows a lot from those ideas and i think breakable items is a huge piece of that i think it really wants you to always feel like you could be at risk even when you are pretty far along in the game i I think this kind of disappears once you um have like a trillion hearts obviously um but for like i don't know 20 some hours no matter how far you are, there's still um, there's still risk, and and I think you need that that level of risk um, since you can choose any boss fight that you want to go to in any order, right? Um, I I think if you if you had uh, just could get the best weapon early on and then just hold on to it, I think it would create a descending um, arc. Not even an arc. You basically be like, if you think of like a normal story arc, is like you know you go out, you climb the mountain, and then you face your your toughest obstacle, and then there's the ride down, right? That's like nice and comfortable. Sure. This would be like, oh, well, you climb, you you start at the top of the mountain, and then it's just all the ride down, and that's not super compelling. I I think it would just be, I th- I think it would not feel super rewarding to just you know blast through the rest of the game uh, because you have super awesome weapons. And, and that, yeah, and like, so in like Skyrim or Fallout or something like that, there are obviously guides that are written. That's like, okay, you just started the game. If you run for three hours in this direction and go into this cave and open this chest, you can find a sword that you will use for the rest of the game. And the only equivalent of that in Breath of the Wild is the Master Sword, and the Master Sword is gated by how much heart, uh, how many hearts you have. So there is that. That's basically them preventing you from doing that thing. But other than that, like, there's no weapon that you could pick up early in the game that's just gonna like you're just gonna keep for the rest of the game because it's just gonna break. So there's really no point in going that ham to find something incredibly useful. Also, the gear kind of scales as the more you play. I don't know. Yeah, I, I, I think the the other thing that I kind of turned me off to this early on wasn't the weapons; it was the shields, and it was because I saw all these amazing videos when the game came out of people surfing on their shields downhill, oh, yeah. and shields are breakable. And I, it's so silly that I dwelled so much on that, but in my head, it was like, here is a game that is all about experimentation. And it punishes you when you try to do it. It like forces you to grind to collect things so that you can actually do this fun thing. Um, but now, like a, again, being honest with myself, I, I always have too many shields. <laughs> like I always have too many. Yeah. You know, and I'm. I, it's not like I can't just get more. Um, so I, I, I realized that I. I think I was thinking about it too much i i think i was like thinking about intellectually why do i not like this why do i not like uh, having just unlimited nice things rather than just kind of feeling it um and like again being real with myself like hey is this actually bothering me am i ever really wanting for weapons um does it does the game ever really punish me like i fear it, it will by having you know breakable weapons the yeah. answer is no like i'm, well, I'm always comfortable you know, you have sort of convinced me I don't think that riding your shield like a surfboard should decrease the durability. Sorry. Yeah, no. <laughs> you, 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 that, they, that should be one thing that they can, they can change that for number okay. two. Okay. I'm glad okay. we're in agreement on that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Otherwise, good, 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 good. <laughs> I, 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 I want to hear your thoughts on, you have a thing here about uh, micro dungeons. And I, oh, I want to yeah. know what you mean by that. 
Um, well, I mean, it's pretty straightforward. I, basically, I'm talking about the shrines. What I wrote here was the micro dungeons are like 90% of the game, which is true. There are 120 shrines, if I recall. And each of those shrines is like, as people have played the game, it's a little puzzle or a multi-room like mini dungeon that takes like 10 minutes to beat. Um, these are just like bite-sized chunks. And then as a reward for beating those, you'll get, um, you know, things that turn into more stamina or more hearts. That experience I love, and I think more games should focus more on that because I feel like, yeah, I keep going back to Skyrim, but it's like a good example of like another open world game. Skyrim has small dungeons. That is true. A lot of those small dungeons feel very samey and familiar, um, whereas the dungeons in um, Zelda and Breath of the Wild are constantly throwing like new puzzle mechanics at you. Some of them are like you're rolling a ball through like one of those dumb, what's that puzzle that I hate? You hate those puzzles. We talked about this on It Takes Two. Yeah, Labyrinth. And you have like it's some like, weird puzzle. vendetta against these like, uh, what, what would you call them? Like um, Cracker Barrel I puzzles. I think they're called Labyrinth puzzles, like a wooden Labyrinth puzzle. I think that's what they're called. Uh, but it does throw like a lot of variety at you in each of these um, dungeons. And if you don't like one of those dungeons, for example, you hate one of those dumb rolling ball puzzles, um, it's 10 minutes. Like it takes no time at all to like leave and just do something else. Whereas I feel like a lot of times you'll get locked into a dungeon in another open world game that might take like a half hour or 40 minutes to like blow through and you don't know whether it's worthwhile, what you're going to get out of it. You, it. It's just like kind of a slog. Whereas here, you constantly know what the reward is for going in and doing it. Um, and you know that it's like a bite-sized thing. So if you've got 10 minutes before dinner or something like that, you know you can knock one out and feel like you accomplished something um, without having to like, you know, really sink a lot of time. Also, those shrines open up uh, fast travel points. So you're constantly being rewarded just for like stumbling upon them, which is great for like map exploration. You're really encouraged to like hop and uh, hop from a shrine to shrine to like really blow through the map. Um, yeah, I don't know. I, I I kind of feel, and I talked a little bit about this during the Zelda bracket episode from a few weeks ago. I would kind of be fine if there were no big those four big dungeons. I could kind of lose and be okay with it. Like I like that they're there. But I think the real star of this game are the shrines, and I could play an entire game that's just that. Um, the closest thing that we've gotten is Immortals Phoenix Rising, which is very similar to Breath of the Wild, that had a lot of these. They were not nearly as well designed as the Breath of the Wild dungeons, for whatever reason. Like There were just some like design limitations there, but... I liked that they were trying to do that, but there's also like a lot of story and like story related dungeons in that as well. So it kind of veered off the path a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I, I really like that small stuff. Yeah, I'm I'm honestly surprised that this was on the list for you because you are such a, a you know, you love a, a fine wine of Zelda dungeon. You were the That's person true. who like really stood up for Skyward Sword HD's, uh, what is it, Time Pirate Dungeon? Or yeah, Great Dungeon, the Sand Ship Dungeon. And we have some people who uh, who reached out to us and on Twitter this week who, who said, like, there, there's a problem with this game. It's that it doesn't have good dungeons. And, and I think that's relatively fair. For the four big dungeons that are there, they're not my favorite. I don't think they're bad. No, I think they're fine. They're, they're fine. fine dungeons. Right, they're 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 totally passable. But that's not why you play the game. Um, I I would be shocked if they don't go the opposite direction of what you're asking for with the sequel. You know, <laughs> cool. like uh, just because I feel like they they uh, they had to have heard fan feedback, and then they'll be like, okay, we'll make some good dungeons. We're gonna put some good classic Zelda dungeons in this game. But I agree with you. I I hope they, they they don't because every minute that I'm in a dungeon in this game, I'm bummed out because I'm not in the world. Yeah, like that's why I play this game is to be in this big open world space. Oh, well, um, so you don't I like don't, the shrines either? Well, I, I don't mind the shrines because the shrines are so short that I yeah. know that I'll be in and out. The the shrines really work for me well as like 
either the first thing I do or the last thing I do when playing. Like I'll try yeah. to get to one before quitting or I'll fi- try to wrap one up. Um, but they're like, you know, nice entry or exit points from a session with the game. Um, but yeah, most of the time I just want to be, you know, exploring and meeting really strange, weird characters um, who have very kind of meaningless missions for me <laughs> that are not super rewarding in terms of like my wealth uh, as Link, but are, are just kind of fun things to go do. Yeah. And they're excuses to uh, explore the world. Um, I, I do want to mention before we move on from that, I do. I want to mention, because you, you mentioned the point about like there not being like great dungeons. And I agree with that. The four main dungeons are not great. I do think the shrines, if you took a bunch of like really great dungeons throughout in all of Zelda's history and like blew them apart and scattered them across the map so such that like one third of a dungeon was here and another third of a dungeon was there, that's what the shrines are. Like room to room, effectively they are rooms from Zelda dungeons that are just isolated to the point where you don't need to commit the time to finish the entire <laughs> wait, dungeon. Wait, wait, wait. So what you're saying is Breath of the Wild is the war zone of Zelda games. The Call of Duty war zone? The Call of Duty war zone of Zelda games. I, I was just... not saying that, no, but go for it. If like, you want to say it... that, we'll write that on your tombstone, buddy. Oh, thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> that's going to be a delicious pizza. <laughs> um, I, to, to make this uh, more of a universal thing of, hey, what would we like to see or how would we like to see this in other games? I think that the takeaway for me is I would love open world games to have uh, less filler, more <laughs> killer. <laughs> like less, you know, I don't need to climb 100 towers, obviously, like we talked about earlier. But I, yeah, I would love for instead of having these like campaign missions that, you know, I, I go into the mission closet at some point and then spend an hour doing a campaign, I would, I would much prefer that they're just these incremental things. I, I get, I, I figure the, the compounds and Far Cry, I guess, is their version of this. Um, right. So, yeah. And those are always kind great. of, yeah, it, 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 it's being done. Um, I I have I have one more on my end, okay. and then I, I think you might have one or two more things that you want to get in here. Um, but I, it, the biggie here is letting people break the game, just letting people break the game straight yeah. up, which ju- does not seem very Nintendo-y. And this gets into systems. I think this gets into weapon durability. It gets into you. Had, you had mentioned before this that um, that the weather actually matters. And when you have a game that has all these weird systems, like weapon durability or when it rains it limits how you can climb or um uh you know like you're affected by cold weather or heat or or specifically uh, with your character that you can you know freeze time and charge power up against something so you can hit it across the map or use magnets all, all of these different things when you do that you're going to not like large chunks of it because because it can't be carefully curated. Sure. It can't be the classic Nintendo thing, the Mario thing, where it's like, we know exactly how you're going to engage with this, and we're going to refine it within an inch of its life. Um, this is very much the opposite, where, sure, you're, you're going to have frustrations with it, but on, on, on the flip side, um, you're going to have so much agency that when things do work it's going to feel like only you are experiencing that that special thing within the game, right? Like, this is a game for everybody, but what happened between you and the game, that that was just for you. Uh, say if you, like, you know, put Boko Goblin Squid Guts or whatever on uh, on a steel box and then write it halfway across the, uh, the map, uh, you know, floating through the sky like some sort of weird, I don't, I, I don't know, some yeah. sort of, you know, link bird. Uh, yeah, link one of those bird. like YouTube clips of people doing like outrageous things with the physics. It makes me wonder whether how, how it makes me wonder how much of this stuff came up in testing and they were cool with it. Um, it seems like it must have, right? Because the initial design of the game, which, you know, they've talked about was designed within this like game that looked like the original Legend of Zelda on the NES, but it had like physics interactions. And I have to imagine if you're going to start at that point, which is like how like how wide open does this game become if you have like actual physics attached to it? You got to know that like wild things are going to happen. I don't know that they knew that from the starting point you could launch yourself on, as you said, on a box straight into like Ganon's face. 
using like <laughs> physics. I don't know that they plan for that necessarily, but they definitely plan, plan for something super wide open. And, you know, as you said, like Mario games do not do that. Like, you know, hardcore speed runners will find ways you can wall jump in a specific way and do something super wild. But 99% of people will never be able to pull that off. And it's not the intention of it. Whereas here, the intention is to break it in really interesting ways where you're sending electricity through, you know, a, a chain of swords or using bombs to set up a chain reaction. And I can only hope, I mean, we have no idea, but I can only hope that Breath of the Wild 2, whatever it ends up being called, will lean into this even further because, holy cow, it just makes... The fact that I can still watch YouTube clips of Zelda today and it's now four years after the game came out is outrageous. Like, it's really unheard of compared to any other Mario game I can think of or any other Nintendo game I can think of. Yeah, and it's a thing that I, I think... I think. Do you think developers have gotten better at understanding this? I think Fortnite is obviously an example here. But player expression is key. Like, that is what people want. They want mm -hmm. to be able to have a goofy thing that they can share with their friends on text or that they can, you know, stream or that they can clip and throw on YouTube. Like, that, it, it feels good to have a moment that is your own. Yeah. And it, it's wild to me how I still see a lot of games coming out that are so determined to have a hyper... Um, a preset experience, right? Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, I know that not everybody on the show loved Death Stranding, but something that I've liked about Kojima's games as he's, you know, changed in his career is here is somebody who went from making effectively playable movies sure. with the early Metal Gear Solid games, and now is making these bizarre, uh, you know. The, the stories are serious, but the worlds themselves uh, leave infinite room for you to have humor in them uh, in terms of Death Stranding. That you can just create whatever weird roads and um, paths you want to your heart's desire. That you can cause chaos. And I think it's important for people to recognize like a game should be both things. That it, it can be authored. And that that should be available to the majority of players. But that you should allow as much authorship as possible for the player if they want to come in. And if they want to erase 90% of what, what the creator wrote and do their own thing because that's funny to them or that's interesting to them or it's provocative, why not? Like, mm -hmm. why is that? Why is that? Why would that ever be a bad thing? The original material still exists. Like, it's, it's still going to be out there. Yeah. So, I, yeah, I, I hope that we see more creators... Um, allowing for that sort of freedom and that creativity in, in their games. Yeah, I, I think there is absolutely still room for the, like, very guided experience. You know, incredible games like um, Limbo or Inside are examples of games that, like, do not have a lot of... You, there's one way to beat those puzzles, pretty much. Um, and those are still incredible games. They're also games that I really have no desire to ever play again. Um, yeah. it's just like the nature of it. Uh, if you're going to have to follow this one path to get through it, that I just am not super encouraged in playing it again. So yeah, I, I, you know, I think a mix is always good and, you know, if the options are, oh, people might, you know, make some goofy physics object happen. Um, you know what? Just roll with it. It'll end up in some YouTube clips and I don't know, people will click on it and TikTok it. Is that what they do now? TikTok? Yeah, that's what I do. Do, do you have any final thoughts for, for people uh, who, I guess, you know, all, all four people who have not played Breath of the Wild or people who are considering playing it again? Yeah, I would reiterate Plant's point at the top of the show, which was tr if you're just starting out, don't try to be too clever for your own good. Just play the game how you think the game wants you to play it, at least until you get your sea legs. And then you could start like exploring and having more of an open experience but for the mo for you know, the the starting area is really meant to teach you all of your tools that you have at your disposal so you just like kind of lean into that after that though and i think honestly when we're talking about like games that totally break them you know let you break the mold like no game has really done it quite as good as breath of the wild has and yeah man i, I just want to see more of that from nintendo you know they the what is it um, mario maker is another good example of a great series of 
Nintendo really bucking their tradition and letting you get really, really wild with their IP. Um, and I only hope, again, that Breath of the Wild 2 will will follow suit. Yeah, I mean, my big thing is uh, learn from my experience, you know, which is your opinion can change. Like, yeah. It's totally okay. There are some people like, uh, on Twitter who gave me grief uh, about uh, liking the game while also being mad that I didn't like it in the first place. And like, that's good. You One, we should all and can all have different and unique opinions that are personal to us. And your opinion is based off of your experience and your context and the moment that it's being conceived in. And those things change. Um, you know, your taste change. The food that you liked when you were a kid is not the food that you necessarily like as an adult. Um, and that's that's pretty cool. So I, I recommend uh, if you have other games out there that maybe you have been meaning to go back to that you didn't like the first time, like Nier Automata, like I think that would be great for you to go back and try that again and discover that you maybe like it. Um, I, I just, I, I, not to make it about that, but sure, we can make it about that. I guess. Um yeah, no, I, 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 I think the other thing, too, is, like, some things are better when you know how it works. And, like, I, we talked about this, I think, on a previous episode with Dark Souls, of, like, oh, the Dark Souls, Demon Souls games got better for me with each one mm-hmm. because I felt more prepared each time I started one up from what I had learned the previous go-through, right? Yeah. And I think part of why I'm enjoying Breath of the Wild right now is I, I do know how to kind of exist within it. I do know how to meet it on its own page. It's not all a surprise. And when I first played it, that part was so novel and cool that this world really was foreign to me. Like, to the point it was kind of intimidating at times yeah. how much was going on. And now, because I, I, I know the gist of how it works because I'd made it about this far. I'd made it past two bosses in the past. I'm 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 more relaxed and I'm like not in a rush and I kind of know some places that I want to go revisit and I know some areas that I hadn't seen before that are still kind of new to me and that is a really comforting feeling. Um, it's like the benefit of getting to play a sequel when the sequel isn't even out yet uh, yeah. is kind of how it has felt. Uh, cool. I, I completely agree. Uh, with that, we're going to take a quick break and we'll be back to talk about that very same sequel. Hello, welcome back. Um, we are talking about The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2. Two! I, I, was, I put a question mark on it because we don't know what the hell this game is called. And Nintendo won't say because they insist that by sp- saying the name, it's going to spoil something about the game. I don't know if that's like a Nintendo thing. Like they they have a weird definition of what consider, what's considered a spoiler or it's like, the Legend of Zelda, Ganon's the good guy now, which it could be. You don't know. I mean, it's not. It's just it's people, definitely people not. People have speculated that Ganon's the good guy. <laughs> people have been wrong about a lot of things. That's uh, true. And, and I suspect this is one of them. I Ganon being the good guy is to uh, Zelda games what uh, uh, the people who are like, actually, the parents in Frozen uh, they were the parents of Tarzan <laughs> and all the Pixar movies and Disney animation are all connected. Like, yeah, it's fun to think about, but it's not true. Like, th- it's not going to happen. Yeah, there's That's no not... magic in Tarzan. Come on. That's true. Except for those drums by Phil Collins. I mean, yeah, hell yeah. That was magic. Um, um, yeah, so we're going to talk about Breath of the Wild 2 relatively short because, I mean, what is there to talk about other than you kind of look like Finn the Human in it with your busted, like, the robot arm? Oh, yeah, um, you've got a robot arm. you got robot arm, and you can uh, maybe transport through materials. Is that right? Well, yeah. Like, we like should Alex talk, Mack? I mean, the big thing, the thing that seems to be consistent, because, again, they haven't showed very much, but what they have showed is Sky is all about the future of Zelda. And it's funny because we just played Skyward Sword. Coincidence? Maybe. But uh, this game also has a lot of Sky stuff in it. Um, the In the latest trailer that they showed, you know, Link or someone like Link is jumping out of the sky. Uh, presumably there are dungeons in the sky. There are towers in the sky. Um, I don't know. Uh, honestly, what I've seen of Breath of the Wild, even though I'm going to play it like a maniac has not totally wowed me yet. I was oh. kind of hoping for something weirder than what they've shown so far, which again, mostly seems like a lot of what we've done before, but Sky. But, yeah. I, you know, I don't know. 
So my my fear and, and mentioning the Ganon thing and like some of certain like a sudden obsession with lore in this series, I'm kind of worried about that a little bit because yeah. we know that Skyward Sword is the the very first game yes. in the Zelda timeline, right? And there's part of me that's like, oh no, is this game a prequel to Breath of the Wild? Is that why they're not calling it Breath of the Wild too, right? Okay. And that th- this is set. We know that there was a hero before even the heroes of the Age of Calamity spinoff game, right? Yes. I believe that's correct. And I could see how this would be connecting those two worlds. That you're, you know, you're connecting the Skyward Sword world and this. And the fact that Nintendo was like in a hurry to get Skyward Sword HD out so that people actually play it. Yeah, but the uh, castle was in the ground and then it's, it gets pulled up. So what's the implication yeah, that the castle true. went down again? Mm, that's true. That I think it's in the future. I think true. it's after I, the events of the last one. I hope so. I I I, I definitely hope so. I, I do. I I would. Uh, I want to acknowledge your like canonical uh, talk and talk about lore for a second. Mm. I I feel very strongly about a few series that have lore and really shouldn't. Um, one of them is Metroid. Has like way more lore than it should have. <laughs> Uh, and, and I feel the same way about Zelda to some extent. Now, Zelda has generally been really good, which is to say they acknowledge all the games have similarities. Obviously there's always a Triforce and the Ganon and Zelda and Link are always in there. Um, and there's the Master Sword, but all the, the only like linking aspects from like a lore standpoint have really just been, Hey, this keeps happening. It's like, you know destiny for these things to keep happening the same way but other other than that they really branch out so you don't have to worry about like returning characters as much or returning environments there might be some nods here and there but generally speaking they like really stand alone and i worry if it starts going down this road of like and don't get me wrong i love anime but like hardcore like attack on titan levels of depth to zelda where you know, I'd rather just experience this world. I don't need it shoved down my throat in like a ton of cutscenes. I thought the way they did cutscenes in Breath of the Wild was like very tame and minimal and wasn't overwhelming. Um, and I, but I'd be worried if they kept going down this road where they like keep voicing people and like giving all yeah. this backstory that just does not need to be there. Yeah, the degree of difficulty for the sequel uh, skyrockets because something that the the original Breath of the Wild benefits from is. I mean, speaking of anime, you, you know, you don't have your memory. Yeah. So really the story is you going from place to place and having these episodic adventures where you meet somebody and they're like, hey, you probably don't remember this, but here's what you need to know for this next hour and a half. And then you go on your own, you know, contained emotional journey and then you're on your way. Right. And <laughs> everywhere you go, people are telling you the backstory that you need. And, and it kind of makes sense. Um, the sequel, if it's truly a sequel suddenly you 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 lose that um i think the sequel also has the disadvantage you know going back to the shrines i mean they put they 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 really did uh, it felt like everything you could do with with shrine design with like well i think puzzles. the shrines are built around the four powers right you get those so they'll have to powers. have new powers so i i mean we've already seen one of them one of them reverses time which is brand new yeah. oh you mentioned the like thing you turn into like a weird water droplet and like shoot through surfaces so i'm sure that's one of them it'll be interesting to see if the old powers also come back the idea that you could have like eight of those powers at once would be really interesting but again that might make it too difficult to like have that many variables i just want to play i I think it'll be very good i have not seen anything in the trailers that's like oh this is going to be like a totally different experience in the way that i felt about majora's mask which again we talked about during the bracket thing the idea that yeah. Majora's Mask took what was going on in Ocarina of Time and totally changed it into something that was completely different and was still incredible and awesome and super memorable, um, you know, still sticks with me. So I'm hoping that they are as adventurous with Breath of the Wild 2, but they might not, you know, now that they have this framework, I don't know if they want to uh, risk what is easily one of their most successful games. Yeah, I mean, that's the tough thing, right? You you create the greatest game of all time, and then it's pretty hard not to just keep remaking the greatest game of all time. Yeah. Uh, I mean, then again, which... they could just release another version of Mario Kart and be fine. 
that's, <laughs> that's true. Um, uh, how about we get into some questions? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. Uh, from Dr. Gannon, uh, we have Breath of the Wild took what I love most about Ocarina of Wait, Time. I, I should mention just... this is Dr. Gannon 7. Oh, thank you. I was really worried that this was Dr. Gannon 6. Yeah, no. Um, Breath of the Wild took what I loved the most about Ocarina of Time, and let me just keep exploring new and different places. What do you all love the most about the Zelda franchise, and did Breath of the Wild lean into or out of that aspect? Oh, yeah. Uh, hardcore leaned into that aspect, because the thing I love most about the Zelda franchise, despite what I said about the dungeons and Skyward Sword, the thing I love most is getting lost in those worlds. And I think Link to the Past does that incredibly well. I think the original NES Zelda does that incredibly well. And over time, it kind of lost its way where it started becoming a much more guided experience, a Skyward Sword being the epitome of that. So Breath of the Wild really did return to the core I'm totally lost in this giant world and slowly becoming a master of it experience. Um, so hell yeah, love it. For me, it is the collecting the weapons that give you, or like abilities that give you access to uh, other parts of the world, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, obviously this game leaned out of that. It gives you most of what you need up top to, to get through everything. And I understand why it needed to do that because it's a big open world and you can go in, in any direction that you want. That said, I think there is a Zelda game that already kind of solves for this, which is Legend of Zelda Link Between Worlds, which lets you rent or outright buy the abilities that you need uh, to get to whichever part of the map that you want to go to. Um, so you don't get everything right up top. You do actually still have to you know, gradually accrue it. Um, so there, there's some kind of reward system in there. Um, at the same time, if you want to go anywhere in the map, you can. You just got to, you know, rent a center your hook shot yeah. and and take that risk. Um, and I, I don't know. I honestly don't know if that, that's actually what I want in Breath of the Wild 2. But uh, if they wanted to recapture that appeal of, you know, gradually improving, then that's the way to do it. But again, I don't know if that's actually right. I, I think for most system games, you look at Spelunky, like you want to have your core abilities from the beginning and then it's about your skill not mm. so much about you know whether you've played enough of the game to unlock everything yeah i do have one critique though and that's i feel like it should not be called rent a center because you never actually rent the center mm. right no, that's interesting unless you can no you can't you um can't. so donovan mcdab has the next question <laughs> and donovan uh, uh a, a new near fan speaking of uh congratulations to donovan on discovering a wonderful game uh do you think a hook shot would have enhanced or deterred exploration it's an obvious fan fave and i get why they didn't include it but how fun would that be i'm gonna say right up top uh it would not have helped in this specific game i think uh, yeah. I, I, let me explain yeah go ahead I really didn't like uh, how the horse worked in the game the first time I played. Similar of like, I'm in a hurry. Why doesn't the game give me what I want? Um, me baby. <laughs> um, but then when I stopped being me baby, I realized, oh, no, this game is mostly just meant to be seen on foot anyway. And the horse is like available if you really need it and are in a rush to get to get across like land you've already been across basically mm -hmm. yeah um but otherwise not especially useful and uh now i understand why they limited access to the motorcycle dlc until after you've completed the campaign i believe um because it, it, it would bust the game like you you should not be zipping through this world <laughs> and i think the same thing would be applied to the hook shot of here is a game that is all about um you know your um effectively gear gating or gating your skill or your readiness for parts of the game with like mountains and yeah. can you literally climb over them with your endurance and i think hookshot would just bust that right open so i think the only way a hookshot would work would be well i guess there are two ways one is you get it at the end of the game and it's yep. like whatever you've already broken it or two it has like the length of the hook shot is tied to your durability. Mm. So you can zip up the mountain to the exact height that you would have zipped up um, had you, you know, had that much durability to climb. It just makes it a little faster. Your, your stamina. The only yeah. issue is then you would have to say that it can't work during rain. Yeah. So, so the, the slight twist that, as you were describing it, came to my mind was 
It's not a hook shot. It's like a slack rope that you can throw, physically throw, and attach to things so you can swing under it, but you can't necessarily use it to, um, you know, get height, as it were. So mm. I, just picturing like you're in, you're above like a chasm and there's like a tree, like an Indiana Jones style moment, I think would fit super well for this environment and for Breath of the Wild, like the format. The only question is how would it fit given that you already have the um, the glider and how does it like work outside of the glider? Something to think about. I I think there will be some version of that just because it's like, it's mobility uh, and and these games are entirely about mobility but i do agree like i think they will limit the amount at which you will be able to like use it right at, out of the gate yeah this is a comment from sophie that i wanted to include i bought a switch in january and breath of the wild is my first game i game i've ever played mm. it feels like the perfect gateway to gaming um i am so curious about this because everything that we mentioned earlier about you know um how I bounced off of it because I was making all these bad faith <laughs> decisions. Mm. I, I, w I would assume that maybe this actually is a great game for first time gamers. <laughs> I hate that word, but first time people, um, in that like you, you can't help but kind of follow the way that it's guiding you without you knowing it. Sure. Um, you know, like uh, there's that rule, you know, like to guide people through a room, you just use light that your eye will always go to where there's light, the brightest spot in the room. Yeah. Um, and I think that if you were just hopping into this, then it would truly feel like magic um, because you would not, you would both not probably think to try to break it. And two, you wouldn't know like all the nitty gritty tricks that game developers use to guide you without you knowing you're being guided. Right. Um, I think that'd be like such a cool and special experience. Yeah. So I'm glad I, that, I am yeah. like, I'm, Super thrilled that Sophie dug this game and totally shocked that anyone who's not played a game before can jump into this game because it's honestly like one of the harder games that I've played and I've played a lot of games. Like mechanically speaking, there is a lot going on in these games. And I'm mostly I'm talking about the combat because I do think the like puzzles and stuff can be handled by people that haven't played a lot of games. But it's hard for, I would never recommend this game to like someone who's never played a game before. I would definitely recommend something that is much more straightforward, like a journey or a limbo, for example, just because you're really asking a lot of people to master stuff like a 3D camera and aiming and managing health and the cooking system and the inventory. And the, there's just like a lot going on here. Awesome. I, I, maybe I'm wrong because I, I obviously didn't have that experience of like this being the first game I've ever played. But to me, it seems the total opposite of that. But that's awesome that Sophie dug it. Russ, what else have you been playing? Uh, what have I been playing? Uh, I've been playing a lot of stuff on Game Pass um, the last couple weeks. Uh, as people might know, Flight Simulator, the newest Flight Simulator, came out on um, Xbox. It obviously came out on PC last year. And when it came out on PC, it ran like, dog shit on my PC, which has a very old graphics card. And um, being able to boot it up on Xbox, I'm on a Series X, and it runs great, and the load times are super fast because it's running on that uh, W, or what is it, N NVMe drive. And um, it looks just gorgeous and, uh, you know, streams in all the data for the cities and the controls are good. My only complaint is that the flight sticks that I have for the PC do not work. They're like Thrustmaster flight sticks. It seems like they would because they support other Thrustmaster flight sticks. They don't work. Hopefully, updates will come. Um, but that is worth checking out if you uh, are really, if you have Game Pass and just want to see the technical marvel that is Flight Simulator, definitely give it a shot, even if you only play for like 10 minutes. Yeah, and there's like a, a, a kind of like an intro option that you can do that just starts you off in the air. Yeah, you don't have to learn all the the difficult stuff about you know takeoff and landing, which is quite difficult. Um, if you do want to learn those things, I you know I, it's going to take you a few hours. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, it's one of those games that I just find immensely rewarding. The only bummer of it is it's it's a. It's a game that you have to kind of commit a good chunk of time to when you're playing it, and you want to do that 
while you relax, right? Like, sure. Part of the, what's cool about the game is you can fly from, you know, New York to LA and it takes that long to do it. And that's very neat. Um, and not a lot of people have that much time to, <laughs> to do I mean, such an You can fly to Boston plant. You don't need to fly to LA. No, there's only one flight <laughs> and you got to do it. It's the, it, they made the entire world in the game and you can only fly one flight. Um, <sighs> it's very unfortunate. You're, you're playing one other game? Oh, yeah. The other game I'm playing also on Game Pass uh, is Curse of the Dead Gods, which came out on PC in February. Uh, we might have talked about it. Uh, Justin might have brought it up at some point. It's a uh, roguelike. The The hook of it is basically um, it, the combat is kind of similar to Hades, but um, you're constantly being um, thrown these curses that like make the combat harder. So, for example, you've got a torch, and when you're in torchlight, you take less damage. Uh, you know, maybe you'll get a curse where your torch goes out at random in intervals or stuff like that. And so as you progress through the game, you're you're making these tough choices of like, oh, can I, will I risk getting more curses in favor of like having a more powerful weapon, for example? Um, Returnal did something similar. I like it. It's It's neat. It is, I think, maybe a little too punishing which says a lot. I normally have a really high tolerance for this stuff, but it's pretty harsh early on. Um, so I would have kind of liked something that was a little more welcoming early on, but I know a lot of people dig it. It's had like a ton of updates. The last one was a, um, damn, I forget the name of that, uh, Metroidvania, um, Dead Cells. It had a Dead Cells themed update. So they've like, they have added a ton to the game. So, uh, we're checking out if you dig roguelikes and, and, uh, Hades. Uh, but wasn't quite my jam, but definitely very interesting. I, I'm going to share what is currently my my top contender for game of the year. And I'm, I'm, I'm burying it at the end of this episode. Why am I doing this? Incredible. I, I, I think you played a little bit of this. The I did game play a little is, bit, yeah. It's called Wildermyth, and... Bleh, how do I describe it? Uh, I, man, I, I keep playing things that I think are not the type of game I like, and then it, I love it, and I just, I'm really changing. Talk about changing your taste. I I just need to try everything, because what I think I like and what I actually like have, have gotten further and further apart. Wildermyth is like, um, I'd say it's like getting to play D&D with the world's best DM buddy. And, and not having to play with other people. <laughs> so you you um are you're effectively playing D D. You create like uh three characters at the very top and you can randomize them and they have attributes like maybe they're poets or they're selfish or they're greedy or they're heroic or they're leaders. They have a mix of, of their own traits. And then uh you randomize what they look like, who they are. Um, and you start on your adventure and the adventure is like relatively contained. Uh, you know, you're, you're just going about the land trying to, you know, fight out some, uh, I guess like toxic evil that has taken over the beast in, in the, the land and, and the settings like very typical D and D, um, and all that's like, fine, whatever, you know, there's infinite games kind of like that. The combat is Okay, um, it's turn-based, and you can have like an archer, or you can have uh, uh, the swords uh, person, and then you can have a, a a sorcerer who is my favorite because the way that the mechanic works is you uh, take over uh, objects that are in the environment, and then each of those objects has unique powers. So you might take over um, a plant and it'll grab onto the enemy and pull them to the ground and hold them in place and deal damage to them so they can't keep um, you know, pushing forward on their attack. Or you'll detonate a table or chairs and it shoots wood into all the nearby enemies, dealing like pretty significant damage. Um, so y- yeah, y- you just kind of get a good flow going. And again, all of that so far, good but not great. But then the story progresses and the choices it gives you based off of the type of characters that you have, it feels straight up like magic. Like Mm -hmm. I, I am sure that the system that they've created for um, allowing you to inform the story is somehow simpler than like, okay, they literally just made a deal with the devil and they're performing black arts, but it sure feels like the latter. 
Um, I am so engaged with the characters that I have, and it feels so uniquely like my own story. So, for example, Mike Mahardy, uh, who just joined Polygon as the reviews editor and uh, does uh, the Fire Escape cast, he was playing this, and when he told me about it, he's like, oh, I had this one dude who got really depressed after my first adventure and, like, literally went away from the the, the his group and just, like, was gone for, like, years, I think, and then came back and then didn't talk anymore. And the leader of the group, because the leader is motivated by people engaging, suddenly got, you know, depressed because they weren't able to motivate this member of their party. And that just, like, happened between missions based off of, like, stuff that had happened in the campaign before it. For me, I had, um, and I'm curious if you had any experience similar to this, In this is just the first couple hours, so I, I don't think these are huge spoilers. I stole one of my characters, she stole an eagle's egg and survived and then raised the eagle on her own and then let the eagle free. (laughs) And now the eagle brings his gifts. (laughs) Another character, he was kind of a recluse, but he actually stumbled across uh, a, this like dude water nymph and um, they pledge their lives to each other. And now between campaigns, he goes and lives with this man in the river. Um, And they seem to have a very happy life together. And then I had this one character who was greedy and she had the option to uh, steal a gem. And I was like, yes, she is definitely stealing the gem. That is very in her character. And she did it and immediately embedded in her right eye. And now it is slowly taking over her entire body um, with optional evolutions. So like, I don't have to go through those evolutions, but I'm doing it because it's cool. And like the most recent evolution is the gemstone took over her leg and it made her like 0.5% slower, but uh, increased her like defense or dodge by like 5%. And I was like, wow, that's that's a great deal. Like, why would I ever say no to that? But now I'm starting to think like, oh, I probably should have said no to it because the gem is probably going to take over my entire body and kill me. <laughs> like, that's the real cost. It's not the 0.5% speed that I'm losing. Um, it It is a trip. And the other a really smart thing it does is, so you you kind of barely design these characters up top. You go through the entire first mission, which is about hour and a half, two hours. And then after that is when you do things like go and buy new weapons or assign points and stuff like that. Um, or throughout, even throughout the campaign, you know, you're, you're upgrading your abilities and adding new skills. Um, so it does a good job of getting past... Uh, something that I really struggle with with so many RPGs, which is like, welcome to the R- RPG. It's going to be the most exciting 100 hours of your life. Unfortunately, we're going to need you to sit down with a piece of pen and paper yeah. and decide everything about your character for the next hour, knowing nothing about them, knowing nothing about their peers, and knowing nothing about the adventure. Um, which like I always end up regretting the characters that I create. Where in this game... It, it, again, like the trick it's playing is it's making me feel like I am a huge part of the story when in reality, I know that the game is doing most of the heavy lifting. And I think that's what a really good D, uh, like DM does when you play D&D with them is yeah. they, they they make you feel like an essential part of the, of the story and like an active storyteller when in reality, they're probably doing most of the work. Yeah, I did not play nearly enough to see a lot of that wild stuff i was really just taken by like very early on just the simple idea of like oh this is there's this other person in the world you decide do i hate this person do i love this person are we friends like what is your backstory and that will then like slowly fill in like that's one of the earliest decisions you make is the first buddy you meet is this someone you are in love with or a rival with and um just that it starts simple and then to hear that it goes really wild is is great. That's really encouraging. And those changes are like legitimate. Like yeah. it's not like, oh, you know, it changes a word or two. No, the no. first uh, pair that I have, they're like childhood um, good friends. They're not romantic. They're not rivals. And then the next pair that I got, they're, it's a rival with somebody in the first pair. And like they don't like each other. Yeah. <laughs> They, they, you know, they, they respect each other in that they need each other to like survive, but like, that's about it. Um, and how, again, how the game pulls this off. And then as the game goes on now, I I've actually broken up my party. So I have like 
two or three people going on one part of the adventure while other heroes are going on another part of the adventure. Um, and, and, and it's connecting the story in its own way through that. So some people just aren't aware of stuff that's going on on other ends of the story. I, I yeah. don't know how it's... I don't know how the spreadsheet is balancing the story on the back end of this. Yeah, I, it's it, it wild. It truly really breaks my brain. Um, quite but incredible. It's, it's yeah. on Steam, correct? It's on Steam. And don't be turned off by the art. The art is like has a little bit of it's it's pretty simple it looks almost like um color pencil drawings yeah um and at first i i was like eh, i'm not sure what this is um this seems like a uh, not childish but I, I i i couldn't get a read on it it's not that i didn't like it i just i couldn't tell what it was and no nah, i was wrong um it is it matches the energy of the game which is just this like really special lovely uh, sensitive place to be um the compassion that it shows for its characters while also letting them be like quite fallible it rules y'all and i i really hope that um that some of you give it a chance and i i know for a fact we will be talking about this game more in the coming weeks and and unquestionably at the end of the year when we do our big you know best use round table yeah, just to put a pin in this, I, w- I do want to mention it runs great on my MacBook Air, which is oh. o- always nice when you can just run a new PC game on a MacBook Air and not have to worry about whether it runs well. It runs great. So That is great. I did not know that, and I am 100% switching from playing on PC to playing on my MacBook now. There you go. Um, that rules. Um, I want to thank the following people for writing uh, really nice reviews uh, on you know, the Apple Podcast Reviews thing. Uh, I'll go really quick. Uh, Chanana splits. Uh, these are just rant. I picked. You 10, nailed it. But no, you nailed it. Don't apologize. You Chinana nailed it. Chanana splits. splits. Uh, C Radman ninety four. Contented Fen. Natalie C. A Can Man. Uh, <laughs> Lord Neckob twenty one. Excellent American. Uh, Lindsay Sunny Jim ninety one. Oh wait, no, that's two names. That's. Lins.ly and Sunny Jim 91, <laughs> G Squirrel Go, and uh, my favorite was I Never Had an Egg Sandwich, which I feel very sorry for that person. I apologize. Um, I So thank you very much for those folks that wrote reviews as well as everyone else that wrote uh, new reviews. We really appreciate it. I also wanted to thank everyone for listening through this episode, which obviously was different because it's just Plant and I. But, uh, you know, hopefully you dug, you know, it's a little more chill. Uh, just The besties resties. <laughs> there it is. We have branding and everything. Uh, hopefully you dug the slightly slower pace. I know p- people sometimes want us to uh, go a little slower. It can be tough with uh, a bunch of people in the room. But now, you know, just two of us, we're just chilling, kicking back, drinking some brewskis. Hey, I got one other thing. Before oh. we wrap up, and it's something I forgot to do last week, and I apologize. And it's our honor. Uh, it, it's it's what we played. We played this week, the Legend of Zelda: Breath of the Wild. Uh, you spoke about uh, Flight Simulator on Game Pass, uh, which you can now play on Xbox Series S and X, and Curse of the Dead Gods, which I think you're kind of like lukewarm on, but maybe we'll give us some more time. Mm-hmm. And then both of us played. Wildermyth, which is the D and D style um, storytelling game uh, that apparently runs well on a MacBook Air, so you can play it on PC. But I would do it on that. I, I was playing on a large monitor, and honestly, I think I would enjoy it more on a laptop. So I think people should check that out. Uh, what are we doing next week? Dude? Next week, uh, we are closing in on uh, the school year kicking off in September. Mm-hmm. So we thought before it got busy in terms of video game releases. We take a look back and talk about some of our dorm room favorites. Oh. Multiplayer games that are like awesome to have people over to play. Obviously, given the scenario, maybe some of these you're going to be playing online, but that's fine too. That's okay. Uh, Griffin and Justin will be back and and we'll dive in, I'm sure, to the Smash Brothers and Mario Karts of the world, but also, also some deep cuts. So please join us for that. And that's going to do it for the besties. Be sure to join us again next week for the besties. Because shouldn't the best friends play the world's best game?
besties.